Hey there everybody, this is TJ for Ghost Cult Magazine. I am here with Frost of Satyricon. Uh, I can't pronounce it, I'm sorry. Sa Sa Satyricon? Satyricon, yeah. I have a hard time with my southern accent. But uh, Satyricon, uh, the black metal band from uh, Norway. And uh, Frost has been good enough to sit down with me and answer some questions for Ghost Cult Magazine and we'll get going. And uh, Frost, uh, this was your uh, Tuska Festival. Have you played here before at the Tuska Festival with Satyricon? Yeah, two times. Before. Two times, yeah, okay. And change festival size between all of those shows that we have here. Okay. And, uh, Fantastic festival. Though. Yeah, yeah. We, I was getting ready to ask uh, Tuska compared to some of your other festivals that you've played. How is it compared to those? The Finland audience is, is a good one. Yeah. At least for us. Uh, and it's always been, been very rewarding to play Tuska because of the type of fans that we have here. Mm -hmm. and, in addition to that, the festival is, uh, is well arranged. Sure. We are taken care of and things are organized and work, working properly. So it's a very, it's a very uh, positive combination great. of factors there. Okay, great, great. Now, uh, do you prepare uh, differently for a festival as compared to, say, a uh, a small club show or a tour that's more dedicated to one or two bands. Uh, do you prepare any different? Yeah, that depends on on what you look at. I mean, at club shows you do the sound check and you know you spend sure. an entire day right, yeah. making everything work for you. Sure, sure. Which you cannot do at festivals, obviously, because yeah. there are lots of bands that are going to share the stage and logistics mm -hmm. dictate that you have to do it otherwise. Um, most often, you know, we make it work though. That's good. Yeah. So that's the benefit of getting experience that even sure. if you don't do these sound checks and fine home things, you still make the band, band sound good and you make good shows. Uh, but like the preparations for the concert itself, in terms of, you know, that, that mental and physical yes. warm up, that's pretty much the same. Same thing. I need to. Uh, reach a certain state of mind sure. where I am the artist and the artist only. Gotcha, gotcha. Well now you're still touring in support of your self-titled album, Satyricon, and uh, you kind of, this, this was a departure from previous albums uh, in some ways. Did you uh, accomplish what you set out to do with this album compared to some of your previous works? Or? Things were a little different. I mean, the whole album is based on jam sessions. Okay. Uh, so instead of having Satir doing a lot of the work on his own before starting presenting already made material to to me, and then starting working on the uh, rhythmic structures and. We were three people gathering in a rehearsal place. It sure. was Satir and me, and then we had one of the live guitar players who were there to assist, so that we could, you know, have two guitar lines and, sure. and all that. And yeah, it made it possible to experiment a little more. Okay. And it also made it possible for me, for instance, to actually influence the material that was made there and then. And things often happen when you jam. You start on. Mm -hmm. Certain theme, uh, you try out different drum solutions, sure. and suddenly you inspire the guitarist to, you know, elaborate on that mm -hmm. and perhaps take it in another direction. And you have this possibility of, you know, inspiring each other. And after a session, you might have started with a particular theme or a constellation mm -hmm. of themes, and you end up with something entirely different. Sure. Yeah. And, could be miles away from your starting point but the thing is that very often that's where you get the most interesting solutions and, yeah. and themes uh, and I mean everything that we did was somehow made in order to facilitate a much more vital and dynamic kind of music okay Right. Well, now you worked with a, a guest musician. Uh, forgive me if I mispronounce his name, but uh, 
uh, Sivert Hoyan? Sivert Hoyan. Yeah, okay, on the song Phoenix. And uh, could you uh, talk a little bit about working with him and what brought that about? I will try to keep the story short anyway. Okay. <laughs> it's up to you. It could easily become a long one. Okay. Uh, I'm sure the fans... Here just happened to see a program on Norwegian television. Mm -hmm. And he saw Sivertarium uh, perform a song on this musical program. Uh, and he had um, his solo band. Uh, and it caught Satir's attention because sounded very influenced by Norwegian black metal without really being in it. is a very famous figure in Norway. Mm -hmm. His musical arena has most often been that of a rather, you know, dark rock oriented music. Yeah. And he has a voice that makes people think of Nick Cave or Leonard Cohen in the early days or other of those, you know, dark crooner singers. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, and he's a really, really good singer and has, has a strong and peculiar voice. And that voice in combination with the rather melancholic song that was obviously inspired by Norwegian black metal music it seemed, it seemed interesting. Um, for those that would like to check it out, it's called Long Slow Distance. Okay. I think most people that have listened a lot to Norwegian black metal, especially of the more somber and melancholy kind, will, will understand what we're talking about. Great, great, okay. So Satir felt that this was, you know, a fine song, it was working well. Uh, with his voice and it, it felt like something different but it's thought that instead of you know having Sievert solo band doing an interpretation mm -hmm. of Norwegian black metal music sure why not have a Norwegian black metal band actually compose a song especially written for him and his voice okay and Satir felt very certain that he could do it and, mm -hmm. and do it really well. Okay. So he contacted Sievert, who turned out to be positive trying trying to do this. Okay. And he also confirmed that the song was indeed very inspired by by, by old black music. That's great. That's great. So so he was very very into it, uh, and then the band you know got to work. I think it. Several months passed with us, you know, working on the song and not being entirely sure, you know, how it should turn out. But then we got him participating in a few rehearsals, and sure. eventually, you know, we kind of we, find, we, we found um, a way of uh, making that song work. And basically, it sounded like. You know, Kind of traditional but really good classic Norwegian black metal song. Very okay. dark, very melancholic, uh, and lots of this uh, disharmonic chorus and everything. Okay. But the choruses and, and Sievert's way of uh, doing the vocals still makes it something very different. But it fits perfectly in the album, I think. Yeah. I, I think. It has a very, very natural place there and it doesn't feel like something odd or, or out of place in any sure, way. Sure, sure. So I'm very glad it turned out the way it did. I, mean, I don't know, Sigurd is very happy about well, that's, it. That's great that she was able to, to get him. And uh, speaking of working with artists uh, that maybe normally wouldn't you, you would work with, are there any artists that you would like to work with in the future that would be a surprise for fans or black metal fans in general or just metal fans? I mean, we are, we are always open to unusual collaborations and anything you know, that can bring something refreshing uh, to the band. We have done many of those things. Yeah, okay. We have worked with uh, the opera choir, we have worked with uh, horn sections and different singers and, uh, and others. And I mean, we might do that again. Yeah. 
thing is that you know we are really open to the idea That's and good. whenever we feel that you know there are possibilities of bringing extra resources into the band and mm -hmm. we'd have a natural place there we do it yeah. there are no very definite plans so you know sure exactly sure. what that could be in the next album as long as you know it's not like Justin Bieber or Britney Spears or something would you would, would that be something that would be <laughs> Yeah, I think you understand yourself that... You have to, have to draw a line somewhere, right? <laughs> it's not about, you know, drawing a line. Uh, if you're doing experiments, we do it because we feel it will be rewarding sure. and enriching. Sure. And that it will fit. Yeah. That would be an artistic decision. Sure. Uh, and we're not in this band to do entertainment. Uh, and. Like if earning money was was a guide, then we would play a different sort of music. Sure, We sure. do it because we like it and we devote yeah. our lives to it, so we wouldn't you know, jeopardize it yeah. doing stupid and meaningless uh, collaborations just for the sake of right. doing it or attracting attention. Sure, or, or and that's really the best philosophy to have because a lot of bands sometimes... Yeah. It's the end result, artistically yeah. speaking, right. that matters, right? Correct. So, now... If you talk to a lot of uh, younger bands that are in the black metal scene, they'll uh, look to uh, Satyricon as an influence. So, uh, is there any younger bands out there that you hear uh, that that you think have got a lot of potential to reach the next level? I'm sure there are several. Oh. The thing is that I basically listen to those bands now that I listen to. Many many years. Sure, sure. I listen to Venom and I listen to Dark Throne and I listen to Bathory you know, and I listen to Old Mayhem. And, and very seldom do I find new releases to top that. I think that the metal scene is a little conservative. I'm not too happy about that. Oh, like, okay. With Turcon, we always try to be. Innovative. We always try to improve and develop and evolve. Sure, sure. But we come from, you know, this one particular place. We carry this one particular spirit. Sure. And there's this one particular current that is somehow finding a manifestation of this kind of thing. And we will always, you know, uh, reinvent ourselves. Uh, but I wonder if there are going to be any new bands that, instead of you know trying to sound like old Bathory or old Darkson, for instance, mm -hmm. try to understand the spirit behind those bands rather than you know sound, sounding like them. I think that, you know, take an album like The Blaze in Northern Sky or Under Funeral Man, for instance. The references are very, very evident. But still, those albums were unique and almost revolutionary creative when they were released. Sure. And they still feel that. Right. feel like that. You know, mm -hmm. you could still feel that. Creativity, that energy, there's like fresh blood in sure, it. Sure. I think. Uh, and it was very unexpected actually when Blaze and Order Sky came out. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I think that nobody can predict that an album like that was going to be released at that point. Sure. Uh, so even if Dark Throne were heavily inspired by Battery and Celtic Frost, uh, the reason that they managed to create what they did was that they brought something else into it. They managed to basically bring that same principle that drove the Atheist band. Sure. And like create a principle for themselves, like their own place or their own spark in a way. Sure. Uh, and then they made something that wasn't only marked by uh, a fine way of uh, rendering uh, Bathory or Celtic Frost music. They added something to it that sure. made it 
different from anything that had been made before. But which bands do that today? That I like today? Which bands, you know, add something that kind of brings their own spirit to it mm. uh, in such a strong way that it almost creates a new genre? Yeah, you don't find many. <laughs> so, I mean, that's what I'm missing. But yeah. perhaps such bands are actually out there, just that I haven't heard it. I don't sure. know. Okay, okay. Well, um, we'll get ready to wrap this up here. I know it's about time for some other stuff to happen. But uh, before I get out of here, uh, this might be a little bit of an odd question, but uh, being from Tennessee, uh, it's not a, a very metal-oriented uh, state. It's more country music, things like that. But uh, I try to ask bands this question, and uh, Elvis is from there, and it spawned everything. Elvis spawned everything. Um, if uh, Satyricon were to do a Elvis song, what, what do you think uh, your band would do as a cover if you ever decided to do that? If you had asked Satir, I'm sure he would have been able to answer your question, and <laughs> even like that. Yeah. Uh, more difficult for me, because I really don't listen to Elvis. Sure. I'm not that familiar with the material. I mean, I know some of his oh, most yeah, famous sure. songs, everybody sure, has sure. heard Elvis, but... Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, you are right, it is an odd question, I feel like, you know, uh, even if... There's a link between everything here. I also feel that you know the distance between what he did. <laughs> there, there's a big one. There, there's uh, there isn't anything that you know feels more or less meaningful sure, than others. Sure. You know, if you had asked about a Beatles song, for instance, sure. that could have been easier to oh. answer because oh, well. <laughs> you know some of the odd songs. Sure, sure. Could have had elements. Yeah. Um, would have made them more obvious candidates for Styrgan to, yeah. to to bring into uh, our own sound. Oh well, no no black metal Elvis. <laughs> so, but uh, not for me. That's okay. That's okay. Well, hey, Frost, thanks very much uh, from Ghost Cult Magazine. Appreciate the time and. Uh, Sorry, my southern accent butchered the band name at the start of the interview, but Satyricon, black metal from Norway. Please check them out. They got a new album touring on it right now, self-titled, and we're out here. Thanks again.